Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu. And on this edition, we're going to be looking back at the comprehensive victory over Newcastle United. We'll also be hearing a Newcastle perspective from Harry De Cosimo, sports writer and, of course, Newcastle United fan who joined us on the preview show. And he was quite accurate about how he said Newcastle United were going to set up. So we'll be hearing from him, getting his take uh, on the game as well um, and he gives a little bit of an assessment on Arsenal as well which is uh, interesting to hear obviously from a, uh, an outside perspective um, we're going to start off by talking about the lineup that Mikel Arteta picked and it was a a strange lineup in the sense that I don't think many people expected it there were some decisions um, that raised eyebrows but that's fine. Eh? That's Mikel Arteta's job as the manager, you know, to pick the team that he feels it is best suited for this particular game. Uh, he went with Bern Leno in goal. The back four was Hector Bayer in Shkodran Mustafi, who um, I had in my lineup because I feel like he's improved um, a great deal since Arteta's come in. Yeah, we talk about that mistake at Chelsea um, and people keep going on about that. But overall, I think that uh, you know, Mikel Arteta has has got more out of Shkodran Mustafi. He was partnered by David Lewis. And of course, Bukayo Saka continued that left back despite Seja Kalasinac returning to fitness. Uh, in the middle of the park, it was Granit Xhaka um, in the pivot with Danny Ceballos, which was another surprise decision. There were people calling for Ceballos to start yesterday, but those that were calling for him to start were generally speaking about him replacing Mesut Ozil, not Lucas Torreira. So that came as a surprise to people, um, I'm sure. And then the front three was Nicola Pepe, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. And most people thought that uh, Lacazette would get dropped, but they didn't again think that Eddie Nketiah would be the man starting and the man leading the line for the Gunners. So we're going to come on to talk about uh, some individual performances as well. But as an overall, I think what we saw from Arsenal was we saw a lot of control. Um, which is obviously something that Mikel Arteta is keen to embed. Um, he wants to see his team keep the ball. He wants to see his team dominate opponents. And I guess it comes back to that old theory, doesn't it? That if you've got the ball, you can't concede a goal. It's almost the Pep Guardiola theory. And you can see that there are certain elements of what Mikel Arteta wants to do that are, of course, inspired by Pep. And, and that's fine. And it's unfair to say that none of them are Pep's, uh, sorry, are Arteta's ideas or that his philosophy would be completely different had he not been working alongside Pep for all that time. But, you know, it, it, you're, you're playing or, or you're working, I should say, under one of the best managers probably of all time, let alone around in the world just at this moment. So it's fine to take things from him. I'm happy with that. Um, I think that Mikel Arteta has been a little bit more pragmatic than people would have thought when he came in. I think everybody had this thing in their mind of Mikel Arteta is going to come and we're going to open up and we're going to play this expansive, exciting football. Yeah, in an ideal world. But given how weak Arsenal have been defensively, I think that Mikel Arteta has slightly ad adapted his approach. I'm not saying that we deliberately didn't play well in the first half, but I think there's a, 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 a bit of a worry in and amongst the group and uh, and from, from Mikel Arteta as well about us burning out too early because we've seen that happen in lots of the games that he's taken charge of so far. We've seen that the team aren't necessarily at the fitness levels required to play his way for 90 minutes. So are we going to see Arsenal play in spurts? Probably. Um, again, not saying that the first half performance was, uh, you know, intentional because it wasn't very good. Um, Newcastle probably created the better opportunities, which we'll come on to in a moment. But I think there is a bit of uh, a need for this Arsenal team to conserve energy and to, to bide their time in games. And I think that's what we saw. And the game management was a lot better. Now, talking about that first period, of course, Newcastle United carried a little bit of a threat through Alain Saint-Maximin, which we all expected because we know what an explosive, talented player he is. And, you know, him and Miguel Almiron are full of pace. Um, and as Harry told us in the preview show, Newcastle were always going to come and sit with a back five and, and look to break with those two um, using Joe Linton as the target man. Um, and those two were, were always going to try and push Newcastle further up the field. Fortunately for us and fortunately for most of the teams that Newcastle have come across this season, in terms of their end product, there's a lot to be desired from those two players. So first half wasn't great, um, didn't create a great deal. But I felt that even though Newcastle maybe had a couple of opportunities 
I, I still felt as though Arsenal were in control of the game. I never felt at any point that Arsenal were in danger. Um, and that's kind of the difference between what Mikel Arteta is doing and what Unai Emery was doing previously. Even when we're not free-flowing, expansive and creative going forward, you just feel a little bit more stable these days. So that is a real, real positive. Um Second half begins and, of course, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang pops up with that fantastic goal. And that goal for me, of course, and I'm sure for everybody else, was the catalyst to what happened after that. And when I talk about catalysts, I mean, we found ourselves in a situation where we weren't playing particularly well. Newcastle were very well organised, clearly had a game plan, which was to come and, you know, make it difficult Um park the bus, as, as people like to call it. Um, but sometimes when it's not going your way and you're finding it hard to create, you need that catalyst. And having a striker like Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang who can, you know, make something happen out of nothing it is brilliant. And it was out of nothing because people talk about Pepe getting the assist for that. It wasn't a particularly good cross, in my opinion. Um, but what Aubameyang does brilliantly is he hangs in the air and he generates the power on the header to put it into that far corner and past Martin Dubravka. You know, the cross didn't have a great deal of power on it. So it takes a, a one hell of a header to, to do what Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang's done there, uh, using those neck muscles, directing it right in the far corner, making it as difficult as possible for Martin Dubravka. And that was a really, really underrated goal, in my opinion. So uh, Aubameyang deserves a lot of credit for that. And like I said, if you can be more efficient defensively and you've got the likes of Aubameyang up front, you always have a chance. And what he did was spark um, Arsenal into life. And of course, Newcastle United had to then abandon their game plan and had to come out a little bit and attack Arsenal that little bit more. And when they push further up the field, naturally, there are going to be uh, more spaces. So uh, Aubameyang, for me, uh, played a huge, huge role. Uh, in, of course, Arsenal getting that victory. Another player I want to talk about is Danny Ceballos. Now, Danny Ceballos, um, as I've already touched on, lots of you wanted him to start, but lots of you wanted him to start in that number 10 position. Well, in a game that Arsenal were always going to have plenty of possession, I think Mikel Arteta made the smartest possible call by asking him to play in that deeper role. Now, Lucas Torreira gives you bite. He gives you tenacity. He gives you lots of other things. But what... Danny Ceballos gives you his control in possession, technical ability, slightly more technical ability than what Lucas Torreira can offer. And so I felt that um, it was really helpful having him in that position. Arsenal were more assured in possession, controlled the game really, really well. He could dictate the tempo from those sort of positions. And that is what Danny Ceballos likes to do. So I think we saw the, the best out of Danny Ceballos from him playing in that role. And I reckon that going forward, We'll see him used in that position in these types of games, in the games where we should be on top, where we should dominate possession, where the onus is on us to take the game to our opponents. Will we see that away to Manchester City, for example? I don't think so. Um, I think that it's a little bit too risky. And it depends on the team's confidence. If we get to the point where Mikel Arteta believes we can go anywhere and dictate the game and, and, and try and... Uh, you know, control possession, then that's probably the approach you'll take. Um, but yes, you lose a bit of industry that Torreira brings to the table, but Sabios brings you control, brings you the ability to maintain possession and of course, far, a uh, far better passing range. So um, I, I thought that was a really, really good decision from Mikel Arteta. Uh, let's talk about Mesut Ozil because I'd done a video the other day. Um, we released an episode which was is Mesut Ozil holding Arsenal back? And I said he wasn't. I said that if you could get the best out of Mesut Ozil, you've got a fine player on your hands. And it's not that difficult to do that. Unai Emery found it difficult, but Mikel Arteta hasn't. Ozil's performances have improved. Have they been as good as we know he can produce? Have they been his absolute peak maximum performances? No, we know they haven't. Um, but he's gradually been getting better under Mikel Arteta, in my opinion. And I think yesterday we saw what Mesut Ozil is all about. We talk about playing in between the lines. And what that means is in Newcastle's case, where there was a back five and then a four, it's, it's taking up those positions in between the two. It's putting the defender in the position where he doesn't know whether to come with you or to pass you on to the midfield man, um, you know, popping up on the right, popping up on the left and all of those things. 
cause defenders problems? You know, how do you pick up someone who doesn't essentially have a position, who can pop up on the right, who can pop up on the left, who will cause confusion between defenders? And at the very least, if Mesut Ozil doesn't provide that killer pass, doesn't play the pass before the pass, as, as some people like to call it, He's occupying people. He's taking defenders away. Often when he receives the ball, he's got three, four sometimes players around him. And that's really, really important in creating space for the others. And I thought he absolutely ran the show yesterday. I thought he was fantastic. Um, you know, there's people that do criticise him that have given him praise uh, after this game, which is which is great to see. But there are those, of course, who will refuse to give Mesut Ozil any praise, um, no matter how he performs, because... That they don't feel that he's that he does it anywhere near often enough, and that's a fair opinion to have. But I just think that you should judge a football game on, on what you've just seen with your own eyes. And Mesut Ozil was good yesterday, um, not astronomically brilliant, but he was good. He was good, um, and he and he put in a really really good performance, and I was pleased to see that. Nicolas Pepe was another one uh, whose performance was far, far better yesterday. Again, though, I get a little bit frustrated with Pepe when I don't see him take players. On, on the outside. I just want to see him turn the burners on and go past people and cause real, real trouble. There was a couple of occasions in the second half where there was a nice little reverse ball um, from Ozil, which uh, I think Pepe then pulled back, which Enketia hit the bar from. And it was good to see him when he isolates defenders in those positions. He is so dangerous because he is so, so tricky. Is the end product always there? Maybe not at this moment in time, but he's such an asset if you use him in the right way. And, and you see that he's developing. Um, Mikel Arteta has spoken about that he needs to see more consistency in certain areas from Nicola Pepe. And that's absolutely fine. Um, that's, you know, what we all agree with. I think we've all agreed that he hasn't produced anywhere near enough as he should have since he's arrived at Arsenal. But it's still early days um, in his Gunners career and we hope that he can push on and we'll see more uh, from him. Now, Eddie Nketiah, um, of course, you know, led the line, missed a really good opportunity to give to give Arsenal the lead when it was nil-nil. Um, but I thought he did pretty well. I thought he ran... The space is well. I think it's always difficult for a centre forward to come up against three central defenders to be isolated the way he was. And, and I guess probably that's why Lacazette gets so so much game time, despite the fact he wasn't scoring, because he does put himself about. He does put his body on the line and he does make himself a nuisance for opponents. Eddie and Ketia had to do a bit of that yesterday um, and I thought he did it pretty well. It, look, it wasn't a spectacular performance from from Eddie and Ketia but it was a confidence building one and, and imagine the confidence that would have been flowing through the young man's veins had he scored that chance but he'll be pleased because it's a Premier League start um, it means that he has impressed Mikel Arteta uh, during the the trip to Dubai um, and it means that he is in contention and Arteta spoke didn't he in his press conference afterwards about the fact that he'd made the, the decision to keep Eddie and Ketia at the Emirates Stadium therefore now it's time to repay some of that faith. It's time to show the manager, um, you know, what you're made of because he has taken a gamble on Enketia by keeping him there, by throwing him in on a couple of occasions up until now. So, um, yeah, interesting to see uh, how he continues to develop. Uh, taking you through the rest of the goals, of course, the second goal came from a, an absolute moment of magic from Bukayo Saka on the left-hand side and the, the kind of skill that puts a smile on everybody's faces, whether you're an Arsenal fan or not, as long as you're not a Newcastle fan, you would have enjoyed that because he just completely sells Lazaro. I think it was the the nutmeg comes the other side. And then the, the impressive thing is that even at 18 years old, he has the presence of mind to look up and pick out the best option, not just lash it across the penalty box. He looks up, he sees Pepe's movement and Pepe scored a goal, didn't he? Very similar to the one that he scored against Manchester United in the league where he makes that that late arrival from the right-hand side, sort of diagonal run inwards on his left foot and he just guides it into the bottom corner. So really pleasing to, to see Pepe get on the score sheet and of course to see Saka being so mature in those positions. And I can't stress enough how much we need to give this guy a new contract, how much it, it, we need to tie him down because there is fears that we could lose him if things don't improve um, on the contract front. We understand that there have been a few stalls in the negotiations, but those are just reports. And as I always stress on this podcast, we're not in the business of spreading fake news. We're just saying what we're reading, um, but we don't claim to have any particular insight as to what is going on there. Um, so fingers crossed that deal gets done 
as soon as possible. Um, the third goal, of course, was uh, the one that Mesut Ozil ended up turning in the net. And Mesut Ozil hasn't scored in what seems like an age. So for him to pop up and get a goal, again, was a real positive. Um, fantastic play from Lacazette in the build-up to that 35 passes in the build-up to that goal. 35 passes, which is the most in the Premier League this season. Um, Lacazette, fantastic spin, um, plays it into the path of Ozil, whose finish isn't great. The Bravka gets a little bit caught out, um, but it's the bit of luck that you need, isn't it, after a fantastic move like that. And just looking at sort of those 35 passes and you see where certain players were were passing the ball from, popping up on the left, popping up on the right. It just highlights how more... Uh, how much more, sorry, free-flowing Arsenal are and how much more fluid they are in terms of the positions they take up under Mikel Arteta than they were under Unai Emery. So another real positive to take uh, from his tenure. Um, the, the fourth goal, Alexander Lacazette, ball comes to him and he completely scuffs the shot. Completely scuffs it. It comes off of his standing leg. It was another assist for Nicolas Pepe. Um, cannons off, off Lacazette's leg and, and flies into that top corner. And you could see from his celebration how much that meant to him. And I was really happy for him. And that was probably the goal that put the biggest smile on my face uh, on the afternoon because he needed it more than anybody. He really, really did. And it was great to see that. Fantastic um, to see him wheel away with such um, joy on his face. And and the the whole team got involved in the celebration. You could see how much his teammates love him, how much that meant to, to the group. So brilliant stuff. Uh, to see there. And as Steve Bruce said in his uh, post-match uh, press conference, when uh, Lacazette swings his right foot and it comes off his standing leg and flies in the top corner, you know it's not your day. And you know then that it's Arsenal's day. So really pleased, really pleased with the performance. Another uh, topic that I want to briefly touch on is is the uh, the, the talks or the rumours um, in regards to Matteo Guendouzi and why he wasn't um, involved yesterday. Now, there was some speculation about him having a row with Mikel Arteta during the, the trip to Dubai. I've got to stress that we don't know for sure what's gone on here. We we don't know for sure. Mikel Arteta said something about the behaviour not being quite right, um, but that could be his attitude or, you know, and uh, James Benj, a friend of the show, uh, correspondent over at Football London, he made a really good point when he said that Genduzi is the type of character that could step over the line um, unintentionally. And that is a great point. And I think he tweeted that. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. I think that's very accurate. He is the type of person that can cross that line of what's acceptable and what isn't. Um, he's a young player who, in my opinion, I've always said it and I've taken quite a bit of stick for it, was thrown in the deep end too soon, was over relied upon um, for a player of his relatively little experience. Um and I think that he's been knocked down a peg or two now. Arteta's come in. He clearly knows what he wants in terms of his midfield and what he demands from them. And in terms of the, the recycling of possession, I don't think that Matteo Genduzzi is particularly good at that. I think that's why he um, hasn't been selected as frequently under Mikel Arteta. If something's gone on, then I hope that Mikel Arteta um, does give him another chance eventually and that the two can work it out and that Matteo Genduzzi, most importantly, learns from it. But, you know, Arteta has shown that he's not going to take any shit. Um, And I, you know, I don't want to name drop here. I don't want it to sound like I'm name dropping. But yesterday, thanks uh, to VBet UK, I had the the pleasure of uh, sitting in the box and and doing some coverage for those guys um, over there. And I I got to spend some time prior to the match talking with Robert Pires for a good five, six minutes. And um, absolute gent, by the way, uh, legend, uh, true hero, um, brilliant guy all round there and we were talking and I, I asked him what, what he thought the difference was because he's on the training ground he's there he knows what's going on I asked him about the difference between um you know Unai Emery's time and, and now Mikel Arteta's and he said to me the attitude of everybody is so much better and those whose attitude is not so good are, are you know are being found out clearly because Matteo Genduzzi has been dropped as a result but Pires did say Word for word, the attitude amongst the players is much, much better. Everybody's enjoying it and they have a clear understanding of what they're being asked to do. And I think that's the key point. And I always made the point that communication was such a big problem for Unai Emery. And people used to take it as though I was just purely having a go at him. But 
that was such an important point and an, a point that was missing um, from Arsenal. It was that ability f to communicate with his players effectively. And perhaps Unai Emery's vision wasn't that bad. Perhaps his tactics weren't that bad, but it was just that people didn't understand them and therefore they were unable uh, to implement them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that brings me to the end of, of, of my review, I guess. We're going to go over to Harry the Cosimo um, and get his thoughts as well before uh, we wrap up. But, of course, the feel-good factor is back. And I know it's just one victory, but it really felt like that yesterday at the Emirates. Um, everybody behind the team, great to see players that have been under fire of late um, come into their own and improve in their individual performances um so that's always great to see um a very convincing win we go to greece now uh, on thursday um be sure to be subscribed follow me on twitter because i'll be bringing you some live stuff from greece because i'll be out there uh, i'm really proud to say that i'm going out there to cover the game um so looking looking forward to that so so much um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, over to Harry the Cosimo now, our uh, Newcastle fan and sports writer. Don't forget to give him a follow on Twitter as well. You'll see it uh, on the screen for you, those of you watching it on the video. And uh, yeah, here's what he had to say. Hi Harry, hi everyone. Just giving my thoughts on the Newcastle uh, perspective from yesterday's game. Fair result completely. I can't I really argue that Arsenal pulled away and, and got what they deserved after a capitulation for in the second half from the away side, um, decent performance uh, before the break on the counter-attack, got the ball to St Maximum, got the ball to Miguel Almiron quite a lot um, and caused Arsenal some real problems, frustrated them earlier in the game as well. But I think it does them a disservice to say that uh, it was a game of two halves because Arsenal really pulled, um, started pulling away, I think, in the first half. From about half an hour in, they, they started to take control and grow into the game and, um, and they hit Newcastle with a sucker punch in the second half um, from... Aubameyang uh, and uh, Pepe's goals um, before obviously two in the in the stoppage time as well so you know Newcastle have to look at themselves and sit and have a look at this is not the first time this, that this sort of capitulation defensively has happened Norwich I'm thinking about away from home in August uh, Manchester United on Boxing Day obviously Leicester everybody knows um, and it's a real wake up call to those people who think that Newcastle is safe um, and, and secure seven points above the relegation zone they may be but um, if you're thinking about Newcastle being safe, you're speaking prematurely because there's a lot of work to do. Still nine points to get to 40-point mark. Some winnable games coming up, um, but I do think that there are question marks of whether Newcastle can get those 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 points on the board. You know, the, Can they go to Southampton? Can they go to Crystal Palace and, and get those results? Not if they defend like they did in the second half. There are chances to bring themselves back into the game at 2-0, but they didn't take them through Clark and... Um, St Maximin as well, um, but Arsenal should be um, encouraged by the fact that they, I mean, uh, Newcastle gave them very little threat once that they went 1-0 up, but Arsenal should be very encouraged by the way that they managed to go through the gears. The performance of Danny Ceballos, I thought, was was quite, uh, was quite pretty good, given all the issues he's had recently with, with rumours around his speculation, around his future. Meza Ozil was, was impressive, Nicolas Pepe was very good, but Aubameyang led the line well. And a big crucial goal for Lacazette as well, um, and I think he obviously needed that look in his his celebration. So there's a lot of positives for Arsenal in terms of the perception of um, Arteta's early reign and and things that they needed a big win and they got that. They can go on now and 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 really push on. I think Newcastle have to, as I say, as I've mentioned before, they need to look at themselves and make sure that these defensive issues don't rear their their heads again in in, in more. Uh, crucial games coming up, um, but I, I I honestly do fear for Newcastle's. I don't I don't think they'll go down. I think they'll do enough to stay up, but I think it'll be a hobble over the line rather than a sprint. And uh, they got what they deserved, as I say, in the second half, and it really wasn't a surprise in the end. Brilliant. My thanks to Harry the Cosimo. And uh, that brings us to the end of uh, this episode. A big thanks to every single one of you for tuning in. Hope you've enjoyed my review of the game. Um, leave me your thoughts in the comments section. As always, don't forget to subscribe, like, share. If you're listening via the audio, leave us a review too. This podcast is sponsored by loserpool.com. Head over there, uh, play the last man standing game for your opportunity to win a thousand pounds. Um, Big thanks to them as well, because they've been supporting this podcast for a while now. And without them, some of the opportunities that we've had wouldn't have come about. Um, and some of the things that we've managed to do wouldn't have been possible up until this point. So a big thanks to them. Um, follow VBet UK as well. Um, and uh, we'll be back very, very soon with more. So until then, take care. <laughs>